shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they had arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, along with a number of the prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowds. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. I'll pray. God, I thank you for, again for your love for us and your desire to lead us into what is true and for us to walk with you in love and humility, to know you and your ways and to worship you, God. Thank you for all that you are to us, that Jesus has become to us the very wisdom of God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. He is the all in all. And Lord, we just want our hearts to be yours, that we might see Jesus and be ministered to by you as only you can do. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah, I'm on. <clears throat> Welcome back for our students. Whoa. Um, they were all gone this past week to Nacogdoches, Texas, doing a missions project up there, um, helping people with their homes, um, roofing, painting, all that kind of thing. Um, Nacogdoches is actually famous because back in the 70s, Stephen F. Austin, the university that's there, um, set a new world's record for the most people to go streaking at one time. I know it was over 600 people. And I didn't tell our students that before they went there. Didn't want to put any thoughts in their heads. Um, it wouldn't have been good to put that on a newsletter or anything, but anyway. Um, which leads me into my sermon. <laughs> what, how can you explain 600 plus college students getting into their head at the same time that it would be a good idea to run naked through the city? I, I know they're college students and their brains aren't fully developed yet. <laughs> but there's, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, I, I, I go, how does that happen? You know, I could see three or four, or maybe a fraternity house or something, but over 600. It's amazing. It's like, you know, when you go into San Antonio and about sundown, you ever been on the north side of San Antonio right about sundown and all the grackles come flying in? And you go, where did they come from? It's like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. And they all at one time decide it's time to fly, and there are millions of them, it looks like, are just flying, and you don't want to have your car parked under a tree where they're heading. Um, and it just go, they all decide at the same moment, it's time to fly. We hear about the lemmings down in Antarctica that just at the same time all decide it's a good idea to run and jump off a cliff into the ocean. Well, people aren't all that different. And what we're seeing here, I think, is Acts 16, Paul is highlighting, or Luke is actually highlighting for us three different individuals who um, come to faith in Christ. I'm, I'm guessing, speculating on the second of the three, but they represent the whole spectrum of spirituality. The first was Lydia, remember? Acts chapter 16, a God-fearing, God-worshipping businesswoman from Thyatira. And she's already seeking after God. And Paul shares the gospel, and she and her household immediately come to faith. And then there's this demon-possessed girl. And Paul cast the demon out of her. I assume that she came to faith in Christ. We don't know that for sure. And then we have this Philippian jailer who would have been just a hard, no-nonsense guy, lived his whole life without God, no place for God. He was a military man. 
dealt with prisoners, hardcore criminals all the time. This is a man that you don't think of as having a, a tender heart for Jesus. He was not a Lydia. He was at the other end of the spectrum. And so just as there are different kinds of people who are at different places spiritually, Acts 17 says the same thing is true of cities, which is interesting. So the first city of the three that are mentioned here is Thessalonica. And Paul goes to Thessalonica because there is a synagogue. And he would preach in the synagogue. Well, this particular group of Jewish people, they went crazy. And when they, they saw how many people were coming to faith in Christ, they got jealous. And they stirred up the, the secular city against Paul and Silas, created a riot, tried to have the guys arrested. And eventually, Paul and Silas had to leave Thessalonica. They were hopping mad. There was open hostility based upon not the message itself, but the response to the message which created jealousy. And they wanted nothing to do with it. And then you come to Berea, completely different response. And in here, the Jews at this synagogue were eager to hear what Paul had to say, searched the scriptures to see if it was true or not, and responded in faith, only to have the Thessalonians come down and drive Paul away again. And then the last half of the chapter is... Athens. No synagogue in Athens, apparently. Just a bunch of elite intellectual philosophers. And so three different kinds of cities and three different responses. In all three cities, there was some resistance. In all three cities, there were people who responded. But they were all over the spectrum. A very hard city, Thessalonica a very open city, Athens, and another city that was just so thoroughly pagan, they thought everything that Paul was saying was just a joke. They laughed at him and mocked him. Nothing has changed. We still live in a world where God can look at a city and characterize an entire city. Now, it's true God sees the individuals, and he knows what each individual, where they are in their hearts spiritually. But all too often, where one individual is in a city is where the whole city is. Jesus said to his own generation, he said, Sodom and Gomorrah will have it easier in the day of judgment than Tyre and Sidon will. Speaking of whole cities, four cities he mentioned in that statement. Sodom, Gomorrah, Tyre, and Sidon. You remember that toward the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he was in Jerusalem and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city who kills the prophets. He says, How I wanted to gather you together the way a hen gathers her chicks, and yet you were unwilling. And he speaks of the whole city. Even though there were people in Jerusalem who did believe in Jesus, the city was not characterized by faith, but rather by open rebellion against him. And so Paul knows this when he goes. He's not foolish. He's wise in the ways of the world and men, and he knows God. And Paul just knows that you might live in a city that is really hard toward Christ. Or maybe you live in a city that's going to be very responsive to him. Even in the letters to the seven churches, we see the same thing where Jesus is addressing the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And we, on two of those churches, Paul, Jesus says that the synagogue in that city is actually a synagogue of Satan. Wow. In one of those churches, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, the church of Pergamon. And to another city, Philadelphia, that was the one that he didn't have anything bad to say about that church. So whole ch churches characterized by the same thing. Whole cities characterized by the same thing. And even, I believe, whole countries can have the same spiritual disposition. We should know that when we are praying for people. Because sometimes we're praying for an individual 
And yet, what they're manifesting and reflecting is simply true of the, is reflective of the whole city that they're in, or the state, or the country. It is truly a spiritual battle, and we are not adequate for it. So that's the big picture here, is that each city has its own spiritual complexion, own spiritual propensity. Thessalonica, jealousy, persecution. Berea, openness, searching the scriptures eagerly. Athens, complacency, elitism, intellectualism. But in all three cities, there were people who responded even though in all three cities there was some resistance, different levels. I also, when you look at these three cities and, and, and everything that's happened already in this second missionary journey, we see Paul and his friends are amazing. These four men, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, they just seem to be indomitable. Nothing can stop them. I'm impressed by that. I'm challenged by it. How can... These guys go through the hardships they went through and keep on going. Obviously, there is a greater love motivating them than the love of self. Something bigger than a love for self is moving in these men and driving these men. Romans 5 says the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. That was certainly true for these men. They were men who lived with a sense of indebtedness. They've been given a great gift, and it needs to be shared. They were grateful and humble men. And they were men who believed the gospel is truly the very power of God unto salvation. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul explained a little bit of his motivation, and he said, I do not run in such a way except to win. And he says, and when I, when I box... It is not like I'm boxing the air. And he says, and I buffet my own body, lest having preached to others, I might be disqualified. In Philippians chapter 3, that passage we love so much, Paul says, I count everything loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. And in Romans 1, Paul, it's an amazing passage there, Paul says that he is not um, ashamed of the gospel, that he is eager to preach the gospel, and that he is under obligation to preach the gospel. I am under obligation. I am eager, and I am not ashamed. For the gospel is the very power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul was moved and sustained supernaturally. It's only explanation. I came across one writer, and he said, Today, the majority of Christians don't know the basic teachings of the faith and don't act any differently than unbelievers. That's an obvious observation. Paul was so different than how the typical church is today. When we drop down and look into the details of, of the first two churches here, Thessalonica and Berea, there's some things here, and in, in, in despite Thessalonica's jealousy and opposition and stirring up the crowds, there are some very interesting things here about how Paul approached them and what happened. He says in verse 2, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. I've looked at this in the past and thought maybe Paul was only there for 15 days. Three Sabbaths, so one Sabbath, middle Sabbath, third Sabbath, that's 15 days. Very short time. But when you go back and read 1 Thessalonians, and Paul talks about how he um, um, poured out his heart and life for these people, and that he um, was, had a, a great devotion to them and fondness for them, affection for them, was well pleased to impart the gospel and our lives because you become very dear to us, how he labored day and night, um, all these things kind of indicate that Paul was probably there longer than just three Sabbaths. But it was three Sabbaths that he was able to be in the synagogue before they didn't want any more to do with him. 
And while he was in the synagogue, it says, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So they're going to come to the point where they're going to say, I've had enough of this. We don't accept what's being said. But they're, at the beginning, they were willing for Paul to reason with them. Explaining and giving evidence, this would be from the scripture, that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. Why is that important? Because the Jews didn't think either of those things would be true. They didn't think that Jesus would, would suffer. They didn't think he'd be crucified. They didn't believe that he would be raised from the dead. And so he's explaining to them from the scripture that these things had to happen, proclaiming to you that, that he is the Christ. I read an article, maybe you all saw it online this week as well, um, a, a very extensive survey was done of a number of universities around the country. Texas A&M and, and University of Texas were two of them. All the Ivy League schools were included. And, um, and in this survey, they were, they were asking students, how, what, they were trying to find out what percentage of the student body on these secular campuses would believe that it agree that it is okay to shout down a speaker that you don't agree with. And on most of the, as I recall, I didn't write all these down, all these statistics, but in most of the secular universities across the country, I think it was 70% of the student body said it is, it is acceptable to shout down people that you don't agree with. In the Ivy League schools, it was over 80%. And then they asked, the, the, one of the questions was, at, and, and what about using violence to stop somebody from saying what you don't agree with? And it wasn't a majority, but it was still a very high percentage of students on the secular campuses, 30% in many cases, 40, 45% at the Ivy League schools, that it is permissible to use violence to keep people from saying um, what you don't want them to say. You can't talk to people like that. A number of years ago, Robbie Zacharias went into one of the Ivy League schools and gave a, a whole week lecture on Can Man Live Without God and wrote a book with that title, and, which is a, a, a lecture series trying to reason for theism as opposed to atheism. Powerful lectures. But that was 20 years ago. And he was able, at that point, to go into one of the Ivy League schools, it was either Yale or Harvard, and spend a week. He met with opposition, but he was able to deliver his lectures. I don't think that could happen today. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How Jesus is willing, but we can be unwilling. A whole campus, a whole culture, a whole city, a whole country opposed, unable to reason with them. James says the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, then reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. Like you, I watched the presidential debate the president and former vice president debate. And when I think about the wisdom definition of James 1, the wisdom from above, think about it again, first pure, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy. Did you see any of that in that debate? No. So whatever we saw, it was not the wisdom from above on display. And that's sad. When we get to a point as a people where you can't even reason with anyone, how do you start? You can't even start with sharing the gospel if you can't reason with someone. Many years ago, Edwin Bloom, a teacher at Chicago University, University of Chicago, wrote a book called... Um, now I just went blank on it. What was it? Closing in the American Mind. Thank you, Ian. Closing in the American Mind. And in that book, he said that in the secondary university at that time, 
he could discuss as a professor any topic under the sun. And the students were willing to openly discuss anything. That's not true anymore. But he said the one thing he could not discuss was music. When it came to music, the university students at that time were unwilling to have a reasonable discussion. And he made the observation, he says, when you are no longer able to reasonably think about and discuss a position, a conviction that you hold, your mind is closed. And that is a dangerous place to be. I don't think we should be op our minds should be open to anything and everything, but we ought to be able to reasonably examine what we believe. I like that quote from Nietzsche, I never say his name correctly, the Germans always laugh at me. Um, that, that German philosopher who said, famous for saying, that God is dead. But he also said, the truth can withstand the hammer. We know that as Christians. So we ought to be a reasonable people. We're not afraid of questions. We ought to people, be a people who ask questions. We're not afraid of taking a hard look at our own faith because if it is the truth, it can withstand questioning. The truth can withstand the hammer. And when people won't let you reason, even ask questions, you can't even start. So to the credit of this synagogue in Thessalonica, they were originally reasonable. And many of them were persuaded, verse 4. So you see, though, what Paul's doing here. He's starting from Scripture. He's not starting from personal experience. He's not sharing visions and revelations and dreams. He's saying, can we just look at the Bible together? And they were agreeable to that. And as they looked at the Scriptures, he wanted to give evidence of who Jesus Christ is. The gospel message is thoroughly biblical. And I would hope that if you've been coming to a Bible church for any length of time at all, you, can be, you are able to open up your Bible and reason from Scripture concerning who Jesus is. To show somebody the truth of how to be in a right relationship with God, to share with them the good news of how to be saved based upon Scripture. Paul was able to do that with only the Old Testament at his disposal. You can share Christ from the Old Testament. It is not difficult. How you can be saved from the Old Testament. Many of us would have, a have great trouble doing that from the New Testament, where it is so clear. But that's the only basis. It's not my experience. It's not my thoughts, not my wisdom. But what has God said in His Word? Can we just look at Scripture to see what He has said? proclaiming to you that Jesus is the Christ. Verse 4, And some of them were persuaded, and they joined Paul and Silas, along with a great multitude of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. Praise God. But the Jews, becoming jealous, they didn't react to the truth of what Paul was saying. They reacted to the response that Paul was getting. Taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, they formed a mob and they set the city. And what do you do when you can't win an argument? Just go crazy. Shout. Do violence. Burn down the buildings. This is not a peaceful protest. And all for the sake of stopping the truth from being proclaimed. Many of the protests that have been going on in our cities, I heard reports that individuals in those protests were saying, hail Satan, and other things giving glory to the devil. There is much more going on here than a political opposition. It is a spiritual battle that we are in. So they tried to find Paul and Silas. They thought they were at Jason's house. Jason just appears on the scene. Apparently he was an individual who had come to faith and was housing Paul and his friends. The friends weren't there. 
And so they hauled Jason before the crowd, and they were ready to kill somebody. And they, verse 9, they received a pledge from Jason and the others, and they released them. This pledge was probably monetary. They, they secured a bond from him. And, and they said, you're going to pay this money, promising that these guys are going to get kicked out of the city and they're never going to come back. And so Jason was held to that. He was never going to get that money back if Paul and his friends never came back. That's the presumption here. And so the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away. They went to Berea, about 56 miles away. And they were having a great response there. Verse 11, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Now, keep in mind, they aren't believers. They aren't Christians. And yet they are readily open to the Scripture. And what does it say? They are more noble-minded, for they receive the Word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That's amazing. Whatever your doctrine of total depravity means, it ought to be able to deal with that verse. Men are not so depraved that they cannot eagerly respond to Scripture. Some are, but that doesn't mean everybody. And there are people who do not know Christ who will eagerly open up their Bible and see, is this what Scripture says? Praise God for that. Clearly, God is at work there. And that's what Paul found with these people in Berea. I know a ministry, they, they, um, they send out a newsletter called the Berean Call. And, and it's great. I don't have any problem with the title, but, but they're, what they're wanting us to all be as Christians is Bereans. Isn't it sad that you have to exhort Christians to be what unbelievers were? The unbelievers were Bereans. We shouldn't have to tell Christians to eagerly open up your Bible and see if these things are true or not. We all, as Christians, again, should be willing and eager to examine what we believe on the basis of what Scripture says. I, that's one of the things I've appreciated all these years at working at His Hill. We get students that come in from all over the world, and they have different cultural beliefs religious beliefs that are part of their religious culture that they've grown up in. Some of them are right. Some of them are not. And over the course of nine months of Bible school, as we're looking at almost every book of the Bible, they've got a great opportunity to just say, does this match? Does it square with what Scripture says? Early on, that can be a little hard. And so I kind of try to, you know, my personal view is, you know, we kind of tiptoe into things, you know. After Christmas, you know, everybody's going to, you know, you can go, well, you know, man, I really see the Bible's the Word of God, and, and, and now you can start dropping the heavies on them, you know. N you know, it's after Christmas. Let's go look at 1 Corinthians, okay. 1 Corinthians is not a book to start with in September. It's just not going to go well. Kelly came in, Kelly Doherty, and doing Genesis, and in the last couple of years, he's thought, man, I'm teaching Genesis. I really need to get into men and women's roles. I need, really need to get into male and female and homosexuality. That's not part of the package. And I'm just going, oh, Kelly, it's the first week of school. It's the second week of school. But, you know, yeah, good for you, Kelly. You get to go out of town when, it's all, when you're done. <laughs> but we ought to be the kind of people, as Christians, we just say, show me from the Bible. That's not, that, I'm, not, I'm not saying that contentiously, not trying to be combative, not trying to be argumentative. I want the truth. Can we just open up our Bibles and see where you got this? Torchbearer student at another school, young lady, was talking to a guest speaker who's internationally known, and he was made reference several times to something she had never heard before. And so she privately um, didn't even know anybody else was in the room. I knew another man who happened to be in the room, and she didn't know he was in there, so he didn't, she didn't know she was being overheard, and neither did the guest speaker. And she said, Sir, I, I, you several times this week have been saying something, and I, and I, I just, can you show me 
from the Bible where you get that. Very respectful, good question. Can you just show me from the Bible how, how you've come to that position? And he bowed up. How dare you challenge me? I am, you know, old enough to be your grandfather. I've been teaching the Bible for longer than most people have been alive. And you're challenging me and asking me, wow. She was a Berean. Good, honest question. And he was not that. And when you get to a place where you're not willing to explain what you believe, there's a problem. These people were willing to search scriptures. And when they saw it in scripture, they believed. Verse 12, many of them therefore believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But here come the th Jews from Thessalonica. They found out about it. They're not going to have it. And so they chased Paul out of Berea. And then Paul ends up going down to Athens. We're not going to deal with Athens this morning. But look again at these three cities and think about it. And I think, man, if, if I, you know, if, I didn't, if we didn't have First and Second Thessalonians, I would say that of these three cities, Berea was the significant city, wouldn't you? I mean, what we just saw, they eagerly examined scriptures and they saw it for themselves and they believed. Good for you, Berea. But guess what? We don't have a church to Berea. I mean, a letter to the church in Berea. We don't have a first Berean and a second Berean. But we have a first Thessalonians and a second Thessalonians. And so again, whatever was going on on a negative side in Thessalonians, this, these, there were people in that church, in that city, I should say, who believed. And they were the exception to the culture that they were living in. They were reasonable. They were believers. In fact, Paul speaks of these in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and he goes, you people are noted for your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in the midst of that context. So maybe you come from a town where you just go, that's the Matthew 10 passage where Jesus says, if they don't listen to you, and he speaks of a whole city, a whole village, just shake the dust off your feet. Maybe you go to a, live from a town, come from a town where you just shake the dust off. Don't be too quick. Because even in Thessalonica, God raised up a church, a small church, where there are people who are noted for their faith, their love, and their hope. And Paul loved these people. He says, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. That was a great church in the midst of that city. When Paul was in Thessalonica, we know from 1 Thessalonians, we go back and read that epistle carefully, just five short chapters. We know that there were at least five things that Paul spoke to those people when they first received Christ. Again, he was only there a short time, longer than three weeks probably, three Sabbaths, but not there for long. It wasn't his practice to stay in one city for very long. Yet we know from 1 Thessalonians that the first thing that he told those people, and it makes sense, you will suffer. Because they were living in a city that hated what Paul had to say and did not want to see people respond. So it only makes sense, it's not surprising that what Paul would say, you live in a city, sorry, but you live in a city where you are going to suffer. And it's not just there, and I believe it is wise for us as we take stock of the world that we live in to expect to suffer. And we don't. We really don't. So if you expect to suffer, and again, I'm not against being prepared, storing up a little extra water, you know, having a sack of beans and 
you know, maybe some things just to get by, you know, if electricity ends and um, stack of firewood or something. You know, I'm not against that. There's, you know, prudence dwells with wisdom. But that's not what Paul was talking about when he told the Thessalonians, be prepared to suffer. It means it shouldn't shake our faith. It shouldn't make us throw the towel in. And again, I thank God for this man, Paul, who with all the things that he went through, there was a supernatural sustaining in his life. He was turning to the Lord. He was not surprised. Got discouraged at times. There's no doubt about it. Got fearful at times, no doubt about it. But God was supernaturally sustaining this man because he knew one thing. The message of Jesus Christ is radically different than the world. And the world is not going to eagerly accept the message of Jesus because the message of Jesus condemns the world. And we will suffer for what we believe. Brand new Christians. And Paul didn't say, Every day with Jesus is going to be sweeter than the day before. He says, you're brand new Christians, and I need to tell you, it's going to be hard. You could lose your lives for what you've just done, placing your faith in Jesus. He told these brand new Christians that regardless of how you're going to suffer, you need to know God has a will for you, and it is to live a holy life in a godless world. The will of God for you is your sanctification. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. That is a message that needs to be shouted. Nothing has changed. It would have been so easy for them just to to go along with the immoral society that they lived in and not look different. But by just simply choosing purity, sexual purity, it condemned the world around them and subjected them to suffering. You know how that is. A young person can go through college today and word gets out that they're a virgin and they will suffer humiliation for their sexual purity. They will be persecuted for being pure. But nonetheless, God's will is our sanctification and we will suffer for it. He told them to love the brethren going to be a lot of people in this world to hate us. When we come together, it ought to be in love. Because there are, there are ties that bind that are greater than blood. And that is the tie that we have in Jesus Christ. Love the brethren. He told them, have as your ambition to, leave, to live a quiet life life in all godliness. We all want to see the world turned upside down as these men apparently were turning the world upside down. And God can use us that way. But whether he does or not, our ambition is to simply live a quiet, godly life before him. And one thing he told them over and over again, these brand new Christians, be ready because Jesus could come back at any time. That was 2,000 years ago. And Paul meant it. He says, did you hear what the, what the Supreme Court justice nominee was, she was a little video clip of her talking, I think it was about adopting her kids from Haiti. And they were asking her why. And she says, well, you know, life is hard. But then she also, with a, with a chuckle, said, but it's also short. <laughs> And that's just great. Life is hard, but it's also short. And for us as Christians, Paul is telling these people in Thessalonica, none of us know how short it is. And you may have genes in your family that say you're going to live to be 300 years old. That is not going to happen. You may have genes in your family where there's no cancer anywhere going back as far as you can see. And you may have every expectation of living 90, 100 years. But Paul says, you need to remember this. Jesus could come back at any time. Be ready. So when we look at the bird's eye view, we see different cities with different responses to the gospel. But in those cities, no matter what 
they're, they are characterized by, there are people who are, who are willing to believe. And we can live in the midst of any circumstance. And when we dive down and look in the details of Thessalonica and Berea, we see Paul being very, very real with these people about the world that we live in shouldn't surprise us and the faith that we have in Christ which sustains us. I'm challenged and encouraged. John Wesley, I came across a quote, said, Give me 50 men who love nothing but God and fear nothing but sin, and I'll change the world. I think Paul found some of those people in Thessalonica, of all places. A few people who feared nothing but God, loved nothing but God, and feared nothing but sin. And God changed their world through those few people. I'll close this in prayer. God, I do thank you for your, your ways that you can see not only the hearts of men, but you can see the heart of a city, the heart of a state, the heart of a country. And you know, God, that some are much harder towards you than others. We pray, God, for our city, state, and nation, that there be a softness, a responsiveness to you, a reasonableness, God, that we would once again be a people who are willing to reasonably look at what we believe, discuss it with someone else, change our views if it isn't true. But I pray, God, especially as your church, that we be a people who come to your word and look at it reasonably and make sure that all that we believe, God, is lined up with your word and with the person of Jesus Christ. And that we would quickly and readily jettison anything, God, that is contrary to Jesus or his word. And I thank you, Father, that you've placed each of us, whether it's here in Bernie or Comfort or wherever we're from, to be lights in our communities, to trust you with the consequences of that. We do want to see our communities all be stirred for Christ and to, and to respond to him in faith. But we pray whether that happens or not, God, that we would be found faithful. Walking with you expectantly, waiting for Jesus to come again with pure hands, pure hearts, God, until the day that Christ comes for us. In Jesus' name, amen.